This week on the Back Table Podcast. The most important thing in terms of a surgeon in the space of prostate cancer is to continue to stay up to date and educate yourself, whether it be adjuvant, genomic testing, whether it be the surgical outcomes, how to improve your surgical technique. Don't get in a rut and don't think the way you do it now is the way it's going to be done in five years. You got to continue to evolve. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Back Table Urology Podcast, your source for all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. This is Aditya Bagrodi as your host this week, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, Jeff Kadedu from UT Southwestern. Jeff is a professor of urology. He's been a pioneer and thought leader in kidney cancer and prostate cancer for almost 20 years now. Personally, he was my first mentor into urology, so I'm very, very grateful for that. He's an excellent clinician, excellent, excellent physician and surgeon. We're really thrilled to have him. Jeff, how's it going this afternoon? Great, Aditya. Thank you. And thanks for the introduction. Happy to be with you. All right, great. So we're talking about localized prostate cancer. Of course, a lot to unpack, so we'll go ahead and jump on into it. To keep it focused, we're really going to just focus on folks that already have a diagnosis of prostate cancer. PSA screening, of course, is an entirely different discussion. So maybe we just start this out, Jeff, you know, whether you're getting referred a patient or you've newly diagnosed somebody with prostate cancer, just 101. Can you walk us through your focused history? Sure. So the evaluation of a patient diagnosed already comes in, obviously was triggered either by a rectal examination or a PSA. Uh, so we want to get that history. We do want to focus uh, in terms of targeted urologic uh, history, you want to get an idea of their lower urinary tract symptoms. You want to find out about their erectile function and uh, whether that is uh, with validated questionnaires uh, in clinical practice. Certainly, either way, you want to get that history particularly. The whole point of, of getting the PSA, getting the rectal examination, having the pathology report available, uh, of course, would be to risk stratify the patient, uh, hopefully at that first appointment. Got it. And, you know, family history and underlying genetics. Of course. Predisposition syndromes are, are becoming more and more of a thing that we're attuned to. Can you tell us a little bit about the questions that you're asking? Oh, well, certainly. You do want to know their social history, of course. You want to know their past medical history, social history. And then uh, and then past medical history, you want to know about the diabetes status. Uh, you want to know uh, their overall cardiac health and comorbidities, uh, of course, because comorbidities will drive a lot of discussion in terms of uh, management, uh, whether it be surveillance, surgery, radiation, uh, and so forth. Comorbidities play a big role. And then, of course, family history. You're absolutely right. Family history of prostate cancer, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer. We definitely, definitely want to focus on whether or not there's risks. Patient age, of course, is also an important factor in terms of getting the history. And do you actually do a rectal exam on everybody that uh, either you're seeing for an elevated PSA, um, I would think yes, but uh, who carries a new diagnosis of prostate cancer? So the answer is uh, a little bit nuanced. Yes, of course, with an elevated PSA, I do, rectal, do a rectal examination. If the patient's already coming in and has a diagnosis, frankly, if, if a, a uro, another urologist has done the exam, I'm okay with understanding that, particularly in the age of MRI, right? I think the sensitivity of an MRI towards the question of extracapsular extension uh, is how I would uh, worry about uh, rectal examination. So I think if they had an MRI, I don't do a DRE when they on presentation. If they uh, haven't had an MRI, I'll do the DRE. And I think as you do, we probably, most people would now get an MRI prior to initiating any local therapy. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say that every one of my patients as a part of their evaluation and management gets an MRI. And is that the same for you as well? Yes. And really, you know, the pendulum is shifting so quickly. But uh, I would say in 2021, any patient who's going to get local uh, definitive therapy, whether it be radiation or surgery, I think the standard of care is rapidly becoming an MRI. Totally agree. And I would maybe even extend that to say, if you're considering surveillance, you really want to have a good lay of the land. How long after the biopsy, um, if they haven't had a MRI, do you like to wait? It's the six weeks. I would like to wait. I mean, I know our colleagues in radiology will wait at least 30 days, but you know, at 30 days, a lot of patients are still expressing uh, hematospermia. You know, there's bruising of that prostate after 
uh, after the biopsy. So I like to wait six weeks, eight weeks. Again, obviously depending on this clinical stage or the grade of the tumor. But if if the typical uh, grade group two, grade group three patient, I th I'd like to wait about six weeks for it to calm down. And we're obviously going to talk about management and surgery here extensively. What if you find a hernia on your exam? Is that something that you're typically going to fix yourself if they come to surgery or do you coordinate with your general surgery colleagues? No, good question. So, you know, to be completely frank, I don't always check for a hernia on an exam. You know, when I, if the patient's already comes in with a diagnosis, MRI, we, everything is, I'll ask if they've had any symptoms, but uh, a lot of hernias are generally discovered uh, incidentally, intraoperatively, I would say, and I am comfortable uh, managing those hernias myself intraoperatively. And so I do not consult general surgery. I think if the patient had clearly a, a, a massive hernia bowel in the scrotum, first of all, the MRI would have picked that up. And uh, second of all, uh, then I would probably get general surgery involved. But a typical, you know, direct small hernia, I think it's hard to pick up on the exam. And if, if it's clinically significant the time of surgery, I would repair it myself. Got it. Got it. And if the patient's considering surgery, take a look at their abdomen. Are there surgical contraindications in your hands, you know, extensive previous surgeries, um, x laps for accidents, colectomies, APRs, or, you know, in your, in your 20 plus years of doing this, do you feel like you can negotiate most of those scenarios? In terms of past history, right? You, you, what you're hinting at is of course, every patient fills out a past surgical history and you'll, and you'll focus on that at the time of the evaluation. You know, anterior to posterior, I don't find any anterior uh, surgeries being a concern. You know, prior mesh hernia repair, prior appendectomy, colectomy. I don't think any of the ant, uh, even hernia, uh, uh, a midline hernia repair with mesh, those are just increase the difficulty of the access. I do think that if the patient had an APR, I think that would be a quite of a quite bit of a challenge in terms of the risk of rectal injury. And I've actually personally stayed away from those cases. I think the you know we'll get to it eventually. But unlike, as you know, and and some people in the audience know, I do a lot of kidney cancer. And as unlike renal cell carcinoma, I don't think we should ever be in the business of forcing surgery into a, a scenario that is anatomically not favorable because there is a viable alternative being, and very efficacious alternative being uh, radiation, so one of the forms of radiation therapy. So I think if there is, you know, a, the, to, for this, any surgeon, their comfort level with the anatomy, with the prior surgical history is important. And if they're not comfortable with that, no one, me or you can be dogmatic about what to do and uh, when to do it. I think a frank discussion with the patient, regardless of age, regardless of grade, is that if you're not comfortable with this anatomy to have the patient reconsider a completely efficacious treatment being radiation therapy. I don't know if that answers your question. It does. It does. And, you know, in that vein, do you have everybody that has a prostate cancer and a life expectancy that merits treatment see our colleagues in radiation oncology, or do you have that initial discussion with them? I generally, I definitely have the initial discussion with them. And I fairly sp spent a fair amount of time discussing the advantages and uh, of radiation therapy, uh, the risk of radiation therapy, and offer every patient an appointment with radiation oncology. Uh, it may be the scope of my practice, but most patients have already come, by the time they come to see me, have already decided to do uh, surgery. But if it's a newly diagnosed patient, I know that I, I do offer it to everybody. And if I diagnosed it, uh, I would say many patients uh, do take that offer of uh, consulting with a radiation oncologist. I think it's, we ha it's imperative that we offer the patient that. I don't think it's imperative that we mandate that consultation. Yeah, I, I certainly see a handful of patients that come in and their kind of mind is made up on surgery or maybe referring surgeon has told them that they need surgery, take a close look at their pathology and they've got some, you know, Gleason score three plus four equals seven and just a few core, small component pattern four. And I'm like, let's, you know, let's, let's take a step back here, you know, even considering surveillance. And, and I think I, I wholeheartedly agree that it's incumbent on us to really run through the, the whole gamut of options. You ever find yourself 
talking patients out of surgery or out of treatment altogether? Oh, certainly. I mean, the common one is people, patients who present with low or very low risk prostate cancer who were already advised that they should have surgery. And I find myself counseling those patients and vigorously, aggressively trying to steer them towards uh, surveillance. Yeah, I think that's very, that's a low-hanging fruit. There are patients who come in, as we discussed already, with, uh, you know, hostile abdomen or hostile pelvis for whatever other procedure. They've had three terps already. They're diabetic. You're worried about them being incontinent. You know, those patients, even though they're, they may have come to see me with their heart set of surgery, I will spend an extra effort trying to counseling them on the long-term efficacy of radiation as a viable alternative for sure. And what about when you get the, all right, you've, you've kind of talked to us about radiation. You've spent some time talking to us about surgery and they say, well, doc, you know, you're the expert here. What would you do? Well, I always answer that question is that I'm 54 years old. So what I decide at 54, it may not be appropriate for what you decide at 65, 72. So I, I do try to steer that conversation away from that. But if the patient is 54, <laughs> then uh, I would say that, look, uh, what I usually tell people is this, the majority of patients who would benefit from local therapy under the age of 60, the majority of those patients, I would be fair to say 80 to 90% of those patients choose surgery. And the vast majority of patients over the age of 70, I think, when counseled appropriately, uh, will choose uh, radiation therapy as an efficacious treatment. So the, the people in their 60s have, I think, have the hardest decision in terms of what is best for them. And, you know, this is basically, you know, a, a math question. It's a question of life expectancy. We know from, you know, many trials that the efficacy of treatment after the age of 65 is very questionable as it is, period. And so I tried to steer patients, certainly in their late 60s and 70s, I, I don't encourage them aggressively to do surgery. I, I do encourage them to strongly consider radiation. Yeah, certainly a scenario that I find not infrequently is really across the age spectrum, but particularly in young patients, this fear of recurrence, you know, maybe they have a not very aggressive cancer and they like the idea of having radiation as an insurance policy, as a secondary option in their back pocket. How do you kind of guide them through that, uh, that process? You know, here we're talking a little bit about adjuvant or salvage radiation versus salvage prostatectomy, somebody's told them that, well, if you get radiation and your cancer comes back, it's going to be a tough go at it. Right. So I, I, I try to tell all patients, and this comes again at the age of presentation, but I try to counsel patients in the following scenario. That is, there is no trial that I am aware of where the disease-free survival is different. That is, the disease-free survival at 10 years between surgery and radiation in one of the formats is comparable. It's not a hundred percent, of course, in either scenario, but it's comparable. And so the fear of recurrence is legitimate, but it's, it's no different than surgery or, or with radiation. And I tell patients that, and this is where the age comes in. So if they're presenting with initial diagnosis at 70 years old and they have a recurrence, they're likely to have a recurrence later, uh, more advanced age and any recurrence likely can be managed either conservatively with systemic therapy eventually, such that the fact is that they will likely die of other causes before they would die of prostate cancer. You know, we, we know that that's why it's a bigger, what you're hinting at is it's much more important for a man in his fifties and early sixties, because if they have a recurrence at 10 years or they have a recurrence at five years. Now they have to do the math. And yes, in that scenario, the one advantage of surgery is that it allows for a salvage modality that has low morbidity. Conversely, surgery, the radiation, if there's a salvage scenario that's necessary, the surgery morbidity is greater, right? So that makes sense? Absolutely. So when you're sitting out with the patients and they coming in with, you know, grade group three, Gleason score four plus equal seven prostate cancer, PSAs of 10. Are you actually using any type of preoperative predictive models, part and tables, uh, MSKCC nomograms, or, or kind of giving them more risk stratified, broader ranges? I don't do that in clinical practice. I think it's 
in my practice, at least it's too, it, it takes a little bit too much time. I also find that throwing or giving or providing data regarding nomograms to patients, the average patient, at least in Texas, comes back to what you said, which is doc, what would you do? Right. So I don't find doing that. I, I do risk stratify everybody per AUA and NCCN guidelines, and then provide them with that information and that the favorable, in, in, uh, favorable and unfavorable intermediate risk, if they have a 10 year life expectancy, they would benefit from treatment, at least in preventing metastases. And if they have a long enough life expectancy would probably benefit from, uh, in terms of, you know, dying of prostate cancer. The high risk patients are, are, I think, as long as they have a life expectancy of five to eight years, probably would benefit from treatment. And I just kind of ballpark it for the patients. I think patients like that, I, going into, there, this is a rare patient who can understand uh, the nuances of some of those nomograms. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I think you have to read the room a little bit and see, you know, what's going to be a digestible format for the patient. You know, life expectancy prediction is, is tricky business. You know, we've all seen patients that are 50 that look like they're 80 and vice versa. Um, you mentioned five years as a kind of a landmark that pops up in the AUA guidelines, 10 years. How do you assess, you know, functional status, life expectancy? I don't assess it in per, again, in, in, in the real world, I think people, community urologists, uh, would appreciate the fact that we don't have time to sit around and in, input patient data into some sort of calculator. And you also realize that no patient likes to be told that they're 65 years old. There's no chance in hell they're going to live to 75. And so. It's nuanced. You, you, you go, you talk to the patient and, uh, you know, and, and, and then when you do talk to the cardiologist, which is most of their comorbidities, you they, no cardiologist will stick their head out and say, oh yeah, this patient definitely will be dead in eight years, right? Everything's pretty nuanced. So the same you thing you have to, like you said, you have to feel the room, get it just for the patient's, uh, health, but that's where if they're, if you talk to, you get a history and the patient is 70 years old and has diabetes and hypertension and coronary artery disease, I think you, you have to have a, a discussion where, okay, well, you might really not get the long-term benefit of surgery. I mean, we, I think that the greatest benefit of surgery is a really long-term, the 15 year disease-free survival. And so those patients, it's a pretty easy conversation. And also it's hard to find, it's a 55 year old who similarly doesn't think they're going to live to 65. So. I don't calculate anything, but you can have a comorbidity discussion with the patient and weigh the benefits of radiation versus surgery and in the, you know, occasional patient, even active surveillance, but you know, all the nomograms in the world, the reality, I think most people in, in a busy clinical practice will agree that there is still the art of medicine, the art, the nuances of counseling patients and the gestalt of how they're doing. And I think patients are honest with themselves and then will come to the realization of what may benefit them best. I wholeheartedly agree. And again, I think it goes into, you know, we're trying to convey a message. If I've got a patient that's 77 with a little bit of grade group two prostate cancer and they want something done, that's the guy that I pull up a life expectancy calculator, put in their history of, you know, have you had a TIA, a stroke, or is your blood pressure okay? Here's your cancer characteristics. And then this little box pops up, there's a hundred people and it says three men will be dead of prostate cancer, 80 are going to be dead of something else, and seven are going to be um, alive. And, you know, then I have some ammo to go in and say, listen, my bar to help you is 3%. Yeah. And my bar to hurt you is fairly tremendous as, as soon as I walk through what surgery radiation looks like. Well, that, that's, that's incredibly uh, helpful. So maybe let's just start kind of jumping into some patients here. So very low risk uh, or low risk disease, um, you know, PSA is under 10, relatively modest volumes, grade group one. Are these generally going to be surveillance patients in your practice? Yeah, they definitely are. And I'm pretty dogmatic about that. I, uh, certainly there are colleagues who would uh, consider uh, more aggressive treatment, but I, regardless of age of the patient and health of the patient, I have my first recommendation will always be active surveillance. If they have very low risk disease, I will be pretty blunt and I'll, and I will tell the patient, I will not treat you. You'll have to find the, if they want surgery, they have to find another urologist. Uh, if they have low risk disease, that is Gleason six, right? Three of 
two, three or more. So let's say half a prostate. This, this would be, there's not nuanced. Let's say they have six out of 12 cores, Gleason six. Okay. They're young. You know, we get an MRI, we can get oncotype, we can uh, evaluate further. There are some patients with low risk disease that would benefit from uh, local therapy. But by and far in my practice, that's single digits, uh, single percents uh, of patients. Uh, I, w I endorse aggressively active surveillance for, for low risk prostate cancer. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, especially with the younger folks, spending a little bit of extra time is invaluable. High volume gr grade group one, Gleason six, um, as you mentioned, perhaps has some people's attention a little bit more. You mentioned Oncotype. Are you routinely using genomic classifiers in these scenarios, either young guys, grade group uh, one, high volume or, or low volume grade group two? Not routinely. And so the grade, low volume grade group two, a little bit advanced age, I will use it when the similar to the scenario you said earlier, where the patient wants treatment and I, I think active surveillance may be reasonable. And if the score comes low, I think it reinforces that. And then conversely, the same thing. If I have a very young patient with a significant volume of Gleason 6, those patients might, uh, are usually more amenable to going ahead with treatment, but uh, certainly uh, I'll use it in that patient. So it's, it's a nuanced of, uh, I probably order the test uh, less than 10% of my patients, but it's, it is to help steer the discussion in where, where you think the patient may benefit. One thing that always stuck out to me, Jeff, that I recall learning as a resident from you is that you kind of preset the expectations, whether that's Prolaris or Oncotype or Decipher that yeah, here's the results. So talk us a little bit about through that. I always thought that was a very useful way to think about them. I, I, I use Oncotype and then in the pre, in the pre diagnosis, I'll use 4k score a lot. And I tell the patients it comes back as a percent, right? A percent risk. And we have to be comfortable. It's not a black and white test. There's, this is not a pathology where you're going to come back with a cancer, no cancer. You're going to come back with a risk that you might have aggressive disease, a risk. And what is that risk that you're comfortable with? So you have to preset that. To pay, you, you don't want to get in a scenario where you get a, you get a result back and it says there's an 8% chance you have aggressive disease. And then the patient says, well, I don't know what that means. What is 8% or is, it, is that high or is that low? So I try to always, before I order any of these tests, I, I will tell them, look, there is a, what it, we have to predetermine our result. So if you have, if it comes back low risk and that's 7%. Are you comfortable knowing that there's a 7% chance we're missing something? And obviously if it's 50%, you wouldn't. So is it, you know, 3% you're okay, 10% you're okay, 15%. So I, I make the patient kind of decide in advance of ordering the test. And if they are indecisive of what is the number that that's going to scare them into treatment or no treatment, then I may not even order the test. Does that make, is that what you're getting at? I think. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, uh, I walked through this with the exact same type of thing with my patients, even once you have the information, whether it's a nomogram, yeah. I might say that a one in a hundred chance of dying, no big deal, but we take insurance for a lot of things to mitigate, you know, less than 1% risk. So, right. And then exactly like that, it's, you know, what about 2% or 3% or 5%, you know, I think having that, um, line in the sand is useful. So let's just say patient comes in low risk, very low risk, broad strokes. PSAs, MRI, repeat biopsies. Can you tell us what your practice is? What are you, are you getting PSAs at six month intervals annually? Do you get an early repeat biopsy? I assume everybody that can get an MRI gets one if they haven't had one. Right. Yeah. So everybody, if they haven't had an MRI, they definitely get an MRI if they, once they come back to see me. Again, I think uh, I do try to practice the guidelines in the sense that someone newly diagnosed with low risk prostate cancer is just that they're diagnosed with that, but they're not a, they're the first step before you would consider active surveillance is to have to go through a confirmation process. So active surveillance for me doesn't start until they undergo a confirmatory evaluation. And of course that means confirmatory biopsy for most patients. Only after that second confirmatory biopsy would I then offer the patient with confidence active surveillance. So I, I make a very big distinction about that to my patients. So if they have a system, uh, systematic biopsies 
uh, ref- coming from the outside, Gleason six and two cores, three cores. I will tell them, okay, let's wait about six to eight weeks. We'll get an MRI. If we see a lesion on the MRI, we'll probably recommend, uh, we'll get a bi- PSA every six months and we'll probably repeat the biopsy somewhere between six and 12 months. Guidelines say 24 months. And if that confirmatory biopsy is Gleason six, then they embark on active surveillance. If they come in with an MRI already prior to the biopsy, high res three lesion or no lesion, someone did a biopsy anyway, and you have Gleason six, well, then I feel a little bit better, uh, but I still would ask the patient to get a confirmatory biopsy within 12 to 24 months per guidelines. So to me, there's a confirmatory window where they are leaning towards active surveillance, but they need to have that confirmation biopsy. Once they get that confirmation biopsy, it confirms Gleason 6, then my practice is PSA every six months. And if they have uh, an MRI, probably, I think the, the pendulum is going where they'll probably have an MRI at least in the beginning every year. And if there's a change in the lesion, a biopsy, if there is a new lesion, there wasn't there before, biopsy. And then the conf, uh, a follow-up biopsy, uh, again, for guidelines, it's anywhere between two and five years after the confirmatory biopsy. So then it just depends on whether PSA or MRIs change. And that I think is, I think that's how most people are practicing now. Yeah. Yeah. Very similar to me. You know, once they've had their confirmatory biopsies, PSAs every six months at 18 months, I get an MRI. If that looks fine, continue on with PSAs at three years, repeat an MRI. And pretty much at that time, they're going to get a biopsy. All right, so let's say we've, you know, confirmed them to be low risk or very low risk and they're fairly symptomatic. So again, if you're LUT, uh, you've got an MRI, maybe they've got a 60 gram prostate, median lobe. How does that kind of factor into your decision-making? The cancer is not the cause of their LUTs, right? Of their median lobe. And so I think they should have that pathology treated. And obviously that is whether it, medical therapy doesn't work, whether or not they benefit from a TERP or some sort of surgical procedure for their BPH related symptoms. I personally don't think the risk benefit of radical prostatectomy to treat LUTs plus low risk prostate cancer is worth it. I'm very conservative about it. I know there are surgeons that would say, well, that with, with significant medically refractory LUTs, why not just take out the prostate at the same time and so you get rid of the Gleason 6. I think the morbidity of that is significantly greater than a TERP. And I don't think you should be treating LUTs with a radical prostatectomy. That, that prostate cancer, as we know, we just said, would never kill them. So they just could, should continue an active surveillance for the Gleason 6 and take care of their LUTs. Yeah, totally agree. I feel like it's uh, one of those things that maybe absolutely bringing a gun to a knife fight. How about if the patient's interested in ablation? Ablation uh, in terms of focal therapy or whole gland? It, 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 is there treatment for Gleason? Are you talking now again, low risk or intermediate risk? This can be low risk. We'll hop into intermediate risk here. Let's just say, you know, it's, it's a younger patient or a higher volume. And, you know, of course we could have a whole discussion on hemigland, whole gland, focal, but, uh, do you think it's going to obtain more of a role or whether it's justified or not be a patient driven phenomenon? You know, this is as much medically complicated as is politically complicated in terms of how to deal with uh, focal therapy or ablation of the prostate. My feeling is that in a low risk patient who qualifies for active surveillance, there is, I don't see any reason that that patient should undergo any kind of treatment, whole gland, focal ablation, what have you. We have you know, 15 year active surveillance protocols results for these patients where they didn't have any of these treatments and they're all alive and they're all fine. And so I don't know why you would treat something that's not a, it's not a threat. We don't treat, you know, other conditions that don't progress. And I think if there's progression, then they should undergo the appropriate treatment for that progression. And I don't think they need to go focal therapy for something that's low risk. And what are those triggers for treatment in your practice? So rising PSA, right? So certainly we know that as soon as their PSA goes over 10, they, uh, is no longer low risk. So if the, if the PSA is trending towards that, I think that's a concern, the PSA velocity, right? We can have upgrading on, on subsequent biopsy, MRI biopsy. So my triggers would be either upgrading 
uh, or upstaging either by MRI or PSA progression. Right, right. And we're, you know, we're fortunate to have a really tremendous team offering MRI inboard biopsies, MRI ultrasound fusion biopsies. Well, let's say they've been, you know, five or six cores coming out of a single lesion that are all grade group six. Um, you know, patient's a little nervous. How do you, how do you handle that situation? If you have a lesion and you biopsy it 10 times, you'll have 10 of 10 cores if it's all Gleason six, right? So you, you can't, the number of cores it, 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 when you target in targeted biopsies are done to increase the yield, but the number of cores themselves don't, should not drive the decision-making, right? So I would say if they have a five millimeter Pyrads three, Pyrads four lesion on MRI and you have three out of three cores that are Gleason six, it's probably reliable. If it's a 17 millimeter lesion in MRI and you have three cores and three out of three are Gleason six may not be as reliable, right? So this is no different than like kidney tumor biopsy now. So the number of cores, I think is also relative to the size of the lesion. And I think that would influence how you counsel the patient. Got it. So maybe moving on to intermediate risk disease, you know, we've decided that between the cancer characteristics, patients, comorbidities, something should be done. Can you kind of walk us through your, your prostate cancer talk for those that are electing treatment? So in the patient that elects treatment, I feel that I try to be as balanced as possible. And I really, I don't think we can advocate for a patient that oncologically one treatment, whether it be radiation or surgery is better than the other. So if the patient, and I'm going to table uh, focal ablation and whole gland ablation, the guidelines still don't endorse that as first line therapy. And, and I wouldn't endorse them as first line therapy either. Right. So it's either going to be IMRT, SBRT, brachytherapy, proton if available versus radical prostatectomy, open or robotic. The way I counsel a patient is I tell them that both radiation and surgery are not risk-free. And the only thing you can control between the choosing of them is what kind of risk and where do you want the risk? And I try to, and I say, what kind of risk? Because obviously we're getting at the co concepts of continence, potency, and rectal uh, side effects versus where do you want the risk? Do you want the risk up front with surgery or do you want the risk delayed with radiation therapy? And the, neither treatment's risk-free. I, I walk them through, where do you want the risk? So obviously all the radiations, the greatest, the most valuable thing about radiation therapy is that it's not surgery. It's, there's no pain, there's no catheter, there's no bleeding, there's no anesthesia. There is no risk of incontinence, practically speaking, with radiation therapy in the modern era. Yes, there's some delayed risk of erectile dysfunction, but there is none of those surgical risks, none of those perioperative risks. And that's the best thing about radiation therapy. You can continue to go to work. There's no social downside too much for in terms of uh, uh, socioeconomic uh, impact from it. On the other hand, right, we know that there's, there are irritative symptoms with higher risk disease. There might be the side effects of ADT involved. So you have to, you have to bring that into the conversation. Uh, so there, the short-term risk of radiation may involve some ADT related uh, issues, of course. But then the downside of radiation, as you hit the earlier, is the delayed risk. Is that what if you have a recurrence and you're still young and you're still healthy, how do you do salvage therapy? So you're deferring risk, I think, with radiation. With surgery, I tell the patient, you're taking all the risk up front. You're taking this risk of surgery. You're taking the side effects of pain and catheter and risk of bleeding and the recovery and the risk of incontinence, at least temporarily. The risk of erectile dysfunction, hopefully in only temporarily, but you know, with organ confined disease at the outcome, you probably have a little bit more security long-term that if you do have a recurrence salvage radiation, we know the morbidity is pretty low. And so you have the long-term security of at least oncologically more, a somewhat, a little bit more confidence in the outcome. So I counsel my patients every day when I talk about radiation and surgery about where and what kind of risk do you want. I try not to tell them what to do. I try to steer them to understand that, that nothing is risk-free. Yeah, I think that sounds like a pretty, pretty balanced conversation. You mentioned organ-confined disease, and you know, of course the decision of surgery and radiation per persists and is relevant to high-risk disease. A little bit about staging. CT scans, do you ever get CT scans on patients? 
again, of course, with the high-risk patient, uh, with the favorable intermediates, generally no, almost never. And then unfavorable intermediate, they all would get MRIs now, right? So if they all, if they have an MRI, there's a question of exocapsular extension, T3, B disease, uh, seminal vesicle involvement. I mean, all of a sudden now you're locally advanced. Yes, I get a CAT scan and a bone scan. But in the age of MRI, you also get a good look at the pelvic nodes. So the real advantage of CT would be higher common iliac nodes and retroperitoneal nodes. Well, those patients generally have a PSA above 10, right? They generally have uh, probably more likely to have concerning imaging pathology, concerning MRI in terms of extracapsular disease or whatever. So not that many patients in the intermediate get MRI, get a CAT scan, uh, unless there's some other uh, concern. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say that in, you know, in my practice, if their MRI doesn't show any concerning pelvic lymphadenopathy, I've essentially stopped getting yeah. CT scans of the abdomen. I mean, if their PSA is in the 30, 40, 50 range, then I'll actually get their chest image as well, along with the bone scan. High risk disease, low PSA, are those patients getting bone scans? Yes. In my practice, yes. Okay. I, I'm very worried about, you know, we know in high risk disease that the dedifferentiated malignancy does not make PSA per volume. So you'll see, as you know, you'll see patients with Gleason 8, Gleason 9, particularly, uh, so grade, grade group 5 disease who have a PSA of 4 or 3, and they have extra capsular disease in their MRI, right? So I don't think PSA with high-grade disease is a reliable indicator. So those patients, I think, I always give a metastatic evaluation. Yeah, I think that, that makes sense. Um, absolutely. Are you surveying many patients with grade group 2 disease? Uh, not many. I would say patients often are usually in their 70s or have uh, comorbidities in their 60s. And they're grade group 2, not grade group 3 in general. But I do, I usually will get an oncotype in that patient. And if it shows them to be low in immediate, then I, I think it's reasonable to follow those patients. I counsel them. They know that over the 10 years, they may develop well, not watchful waiting. So if they have progression, we would try to initiate treatment, but there's a risk of metastatic progression as we know. Yeah. And does the uh, percent pattern four play into that conversation? So let's say they're, you know, 50% core involvement, 90% grade, you know, pattern three, 10% pattern four. Yeah. So I think those are, that's the, that's the favorable intermediate patient, right? So I think in an older age, that's uh, surveillance makes a lot of sense for those patients. As opposed to the grade group three, if it's 60, 70% pattern four, no. Right, right. Yeah. And I mean, even further into the weeds, you know, oftentimes it's a single core of uh, grade group, single core of grade group two. And in that core, you have 5% pattern four. And I'll often try to talk patients off the ledge yeah. in, in that scenario. Well, and that's also the scenario where a confirmatory biopsy is going to be critical, right? So they need an MRI, they need to go to a confirmatory biopsy. And if your confirmatory biopsy still shows low volume pattern four, I think you're, you'll feel a lot more confident. I would not, again, no one goes into active surveillance until they finish the second biopsy. So that's the confirmatory biopsy. So you, I, don't, I can't give someone advice to do active surveillance. They can just hit, they just enter this limbo period until they get the MRI. 12 months later, six months later, get another biopsy. Totally makes sense. And, and you kind of touched on this earlier when you, when you talked about radiation and clearly, you know, the way that radiation can be delivered is extensive brachytherapy, combination therapy with or without ADT, SBRT, and so forth. If you're starting hormones, do you start them on vitamin D and calcium or get your endocrinology colleagues involved in early? Yes. The answer is yes. We, um, you know, if they go short-term ADT, six months for intermediate, uh, fa favor unfavorable intermediate risk disease and they get six months of ADT, yeah, they should get calcium and vitamin D. I don't get endocrinology involved with that, in that patient. So, and I don't really know, uh, you know, six months of vitamin D and calcium when the patient should recover is going to make that big of a deal. But high-risk patients, they're going to go for two years, likely two years of ADT. Uh, they should be aggressively managed. And what about, you know, going back to prostate anatomy, you know, larger lobes, median lobes, is that going to be a relative contraindication to radiation in your practice? So this is an, that's an example where you think that surgery might offer the patient better outcomes in terms of the urinary symptoms is, I think that's where you're getting at, mm -hmm. but I would not counsel that patient without them actually 
seeing and visiting with a radiation oncologist and having that radi the radiation oncology the oncologist counsel and address that with the patient as well. So I, that, that makes sense, you know, especially the patient, if they're going to get ADT with their rate, with the radiation therapy, I just want to have a more nuanced discussion with the radiation oncologist who often are pretty straightforward, the patient, and that they'll be able to, they'll, they'll tell the patient off, you know, and our institution, as you know, that surgery may be a better option for them because of their, you know, hundred gram prostate with a median lobe. Yeah, I think it's fair. I mean, you know, certainly if they're getting ADT, you maybe have a little bit of a run in and you get some shrinkage, you have some improvement in symptoms, but I would agree that the reflexive, you know, 50 grams or larger is automatic surgery is probably of historical interest and non-data driven. Yeah. So kind of getting a little bit into the nuts and bolts of it, you know, urinary symptoms wise, what do you tell the patients if they're electing for, let's just leave it at radiation again, comes in so many flavors with various iterations that that conversation needs to comprehensively happen with a radiation oncologist, just like surgery with us. But in terms of urinary symptoms, uh, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what you tell the patients that they can kind of expect over the, you know, the days, weeks, and months following surgery? You know, every, I think the practice now is that most people get, if they do surgery, they do it robotically. So the anastomosis is so well visualized that most of us just leave a catheter in for some five to seven days. And so I tell a patient, once the catheter comes out, in my practice, about 40% or more of the patients will have zero to minimal leakage for a few days, and then they, they do well. But I, what I try to do, in fact, is tell the patients that, you know, can't count on that. And so what you want to do is focus on more of the intermediate term. So I counsel patients that, look, you're going to probably have some, some degree of stress incontinence for a couple of weeks, couple of months. And, you know, in experienced hands, probably 95% of patients, regardless of age, are going to regain social continence by uh, six months. That's what I tell people. And I think that's pretty fair. So I don't want to promise them, over promise them that they're going to have instant conti continence, though some do. And I try to prepare them that usually within three to four months, that continence will uh, recover. And there's a few guys who straggle and struggle at six months. But I think one of the biggest important things to tell people is that any incontinence that goes beyond six months is correctable, in my opinion. The biggest knock on surgery, the biggest criticism and fear of uh, the patients is that they're going to be incontinent for life. And as you know, that's incredibly unlikely, incredibly rare. It is also, unfortunately, incredibly common that the average urologist who does radical prostatectomy, including myself, do not know how to surgically correct stress incontinence in a male. And so having a partner, which we're fortunate to have who can correct this, whether it be a, you know, a male urethral sling and in the rare case, patient an artificial sphincter, I tell patients, look, surgery, you have a short-term risk of incontinence. But the only reason you're going to be in a diaper the rest of your life is if you choose to do so. And any friend of yours who had surgery is incontinent, and that's why you don't want to have surgery because your friend Joe has been incontinent for three years. Joe was never given the appropriate medical advice to seek surgical correction of his incontinence. I don't see any reason a man after medical prostatectomy should be incontinent beyond six to nine months. And that's the, that's where the patients have misconceptions. I think that's an important point. Patients come in to see us so afraid of surgery because they think they're going to be a diaper forever. And that is farthest from the truth in the 21st century. Yeah, I agree. You know, I kind of run through the statistics and so forth and my personal statistics, of course, and then I'll tell them off the record, you should be dry ultimately. You're right. And with that being said, when it comes to the kind of erectile aspects of the, of the talk, of the prostate cancer surgery talk, I will not go off the record and say off the record, you should be potent. I think that's a, a lot harder to, <laughs> to kind of guarantee if you will. Um, before we move into, um, to the erectile aspect of it. So I, I typically have my patients do kegels for about a week, 10 days prior. And if they're really struggling with incontinence, either small volume that's bothersome or larger volume, which I found it impossible to predict who that patient's going to be. I'll get them in to see the pelvic floor physical therapy, 
generally wait to see how they're doing six to eight weeks out. But if they're really having a hard time, you know, just have them see our colleagues who are actually tremendous. Anything to add to that? No, I think that's a really good point that uh, I don't know how widely available it is in the community, but we do uh, benefit at the, at the university setting of having pelvic floor physical therapy. And I will do the same. I, I will give the pay. I usually see my patients back somewhere between eight and 12 weeks after surgery. And if they are still struggling with continence at that point, and it's significant, if you can say, oh, they're getting better every day, you can predict that this is mild, one pad a day. I don't think you have to do anything. But otherwise, you know, I will then send them to PT because I don't think we should intervene surgically on these patients until they're well beyond six months to maybe nine months. So they still have a window of time. And I think the physical floor therapy is something that people in the audience uh, should inquire about for their patients because it, it does help. It's not dramatic, but we do see improvement and patients, uh, patient reported improvement with, with that kind of teaching. Okay. So I think we got a really nice flavor for, for the incontinence aspect of it. Erections wise, how does that conversation go? And maybe I'll start out with, you know, if they've got an MRI with some concern for extra prosthetic extension, are you framing this as a, you know, likely going to be a unilateral nerve sparing, or is that an intraoperative decision for you? I mean, of course there's shades of gray. Acknowledging that there's shades of gray and there's variable extent of extra capsule extension. You know, I don't think MRI is the most reliable predictor unless it's gross extra capsule extension. So I always in my practice, leave it to an intraoperative decision. And I think as one gets experienced, they, one can uh, feel more confident doing that. So I'm not against empiric counseling of unilateral nerve sparing, but I think as one develops more and more experience and confidence and follows their outcomes, looks at you know, what they did versus what the pathologic outcome was, I think you can nuancely make that an intraoperative decision. There really is partial nerve sparing. Again, with more experience, you can do that. And, and, and so I try to tell patients that we will decide intraoperatively to answer your question. And uh, I feel strongly about that. I personally, at this point in my career, don't believe that empiric preoperative decision-making on unilateral nerve sparing should be done unless the MRI clearly shows T3 disease. And can you give us a little bit of your counseling on timeline and statistics? for recovery of potency? Well, I tell, I'll tell patients all the time the following. The recovery of your potency depends upon the volume of disease in the stage, depends on your preoperative performance status. I'm never going to make you better. It depends on your age. The younger guys take a licking and keep on ticking a lot easier than the older guy. And then the last factor is depends on your surgeon. So. I can't control their preoperative status. I can't control their age. I cannot control the volume of disease. So there is value in counseling a patient when they're younger, you know, back to the active surveillance and three plus three uh, grade group two disease. Do you do active surveillance? Well, if you're young and if you're, you have a low volume, it's more likely I'm going to have a better outcome. And then age, right? So the 40 year olds, 50, 40 year decade, the 50 decade, the 60 decade, the 70 decade, patients just incrementally do worse with every decade of life in all the studies that have been done. So I try to nuance all that in. So you, you know, unlike continence where I think them almost no matter what age, 95% of those patients are going to be continent. Uh, it could be a week or six months. Potency really is nuanced. So you, you, then you want to you want to ask me. You have to give me a scenario. Is it a fifty five year old low volume disease, perfect erections? He's going to do you know eighty ninety percent. And if you're seventy years old with high volume uh, disease and preoperative uh, PDE five inhibitors and a hundred milligram dose of Agra because it it's already struggling. Well, you know that guy is not going to be potent no matter how good you think you are of a surgeon. So. It's a much more nuanced discussion, but I also tell the patient that just like continence, what you lose is erectile function, right? We don't, you know, a lot of patients are, have a misconception that they'll never have sex again. A lot of patients have a misconception that they never have sensory function again. There are 
a plethora of, of technologies and means to get erectile function restored. And we will start that immediately after surgery. And I think if you counsel patients that way uh, and you really make sure they understand what the consequences are, I think they are much more accepting of that risk and knowing that they can regain function. Uh, particularly if they're in a stable relationship, their partner would be supportive. I kind of tell all my patients, it's a weird thing to wrap your brain around, but you can actually have an orgasm without having an erection and without having an ejaculation. And usually there's some kind of shock and disbelief that follows, but, <laughs> and, and I wholeheartedly agree, you know, obviously we work in the, in the same practice. We've got really nice support, but, you know, starting in with, um, low dose phosphodiesterase inhibitors and ramping up based on prioritization based on function with, um, vacuum erection devices, injections, and, you know, ultimately if they do require surgical therapy, we've got, um, you know, people that, that do that, uh, routinely and are very, very good. Jeff's an excellent surgeon. I feel super fortunate to have trained with him. You know, there's, there's so much we could cover in terms of lymph node dissection, confidence maintenance techniques, which I think are going to be kind of outside of the scope. So you mentioned you, get your, you see them at age 12 weeks. That's where you get your first PSA, kind of get a lay of the land. We talked a little bit about pelvic floor physical therapy, went to incorporate. Let's say the pathology comes back, you know, for, fairly aggressive. PSA is fortunately undetectable. Are there patients that you send for true adjuvant radiotherapy? Yes, there are patients I send for at least a consultation that I do reflexively and I won't put, be a paternalistic and, and not offer to the patient. So what I'm getting at is some, you know, some people would say, oh, we should always wait and wait for, don't, do not send them to radiation oncology, but I do. Anybody with a node positive disease, I send for consultation with medical oncology and radiation oncology. So then outside of that group, if they have high risk cancer, it's T3 and they have a positive margin. I send those patients for a consultation with radiation oncology. I think those patients are at high risk. If they were nodes were negative and they had T3 disease, I may have missed a node. And they actually obviously have a risk for early local recurrence. If they have high risk disease or, you know, a gray group three disease is T3A, but negative margins, I often will not send that patient for radiation consultation. I think if they have negative margins, any patient that has a positive margin in T2 disease, I usually will watch it because I, even when I look, I think some of those for sure, we know are going to be iatrogenic and not real T2 positive margins. It's I, I, I feel confident enough at, at, at this point in my career that I probably didn't leave any real prostate behind if they have a positive margin T2. So those patients I usually watch. And so I think that kind of covers the group that the scenario is where you would consider radiation, positive margin, T3 disease, N1 disease, N1, yes, T3 with positive margin, yes, T3 with negative margin, probably not T2 without, with a positive margin, probably not. Totally. And are, for the high risk patients, are you kind of prepping for these possible scenarios on the front end, pre-surgical counseling? Absolutely. I, uh, when I see a high risk prostate cancer patient, I tell them that, uh, this is not your unimodality cancer, that this is, you have to be thinking about this as multimodal therapy, like we do with other cancer. And if we do surgery first, you have to be mentally prepared for having adjuvant or salvage radiation therapy. And if it's N positive disease, you know, probably systemic therapy to, for some period of time as well. So I prepare them all that anybody with high risk or T3 disease, you know, it could be intermediate risk, but they have T3 and MRI. I will tell them that we are going into this as multimodal therapy. Yeah. I think that's absolutely mandatory for managing expectations. And, you know, right. of course, if you do this, you're going to see persistently positive PSAs or PSA recurrences. And just to kind of keep the floor from falling out of our patient's legs, letting them know that that's a possibility is mandatory. So I, I think we've covered the gamut of it. I mean, of course, we could talk about localized prostate cancer until, uh, until the cows come home. Over the course of your career, you know, in kidney and in prostate, you've seen less and less invasive options. Um, and 
Do you think for prostate cancer, you know, with earlier tools like MRI for screening, ablations, uh, minimally invasive prostatectomy, is prostatectomy going to be like the cabbage to cardiac stents? <laughs> is that kind of an analogy for us? Uh, is that what's coming? And how do we keep up with, uh, with emerging technologies? I mean, there's IRE, there's Tulsa, there's HIFU, there's cryo. You know, you, you've kind of been on the, on the head of technology for your entirety of your career, but maybe just kind of, a you know, give us that perspective from your end. Well, I, I think that radical prostatectomy, uh, robotically or open, you know, hasn't gone away since the 1980s. I think the selection for patients is getting tighter and tighter so that, you know, we're not treating all Gleason 6 with radical prostatectomy anymore. And I think, you know, as you know, my experience in kidney, I, I adopted ablation very early. I did not adopt ablation very early in prostate, but and maybe I missed the window there myself. But the point being is there's still a role for surgery in kidney cancer, right? We still do nephrectomies. There's still partial nephrectomies that are not amenable to ablation technologies in kidney. And I think it's going to the same thing. We may see for sure an appropriate, well-defined role for focal therapy. We're going to see that ablative technologies will, again, focal or whole gland will certainly be for selected patients, whether, you know, they'll be elderly or not good surgical candidates. But I think we'll always see perhaps a diminishing role for surgery, but there'll always still be a role for radical prostatectomy, the high volume, high risk patients, perhaps, um, no different than, than it is in kidney ablation, you know, the, uh, the cryotherapy, radiofrequency, SBRT is still niche patients that have are ideal for those treatments. And then everybody else has surgery. And so it may not be a hundred patient, hundred percent of patients benefit from surgery, but we'll still have some degree of radical prostatectomy. Now, the, the next question then, of course, is can we get less and less invasive? I don't think that's the question as much as can we continue to improve outcomes? How do we continue to improve continence and potency so that the surgical expectations are no different than taking your, the ideal thing was surgery should, for radical prostatectomy should be no different than appendectomy. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be nice. Uh... Right. And if it is, if we can get to be no different than appendectomy, then there's always going to be a role for surgery. Absolutely. So we just have to continue to improve rather than accept our outcomes. And we have, I mean, ro robotic surgery has revolutionized some of the outcomes uh, in the playing field for surgery. And we should, we just need to continue to educate for, regarding that. Well, Jeff, you know, I, I have always enjoyed learning from you. You've always been super thoughtful and, uh, you know, over the course of this hour, you know, nothing, nothing different, a lot of good pearls for me to take home. Any thoughts uh, for our, our listenership before we wrap it up? The most important thing in terms of a surgeon in the space of prostate cancer is to continue to stay up to date and educate yourself, whether it be adjuvant, genomic testing, whether it be the surgical outcomes, how to improve your surgical technique. Don't get in a rut and don't think the way you do it now is the way it's going to be done in five years. You got to continue to evolve. That's perfect. Well, you know, again, appreciate your time. Jeff Kadedu, uh, senior author of the AUA Localized Prostate Cancer Guidelines. Um, all right, Jeff, that was perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.